Coach Larry Kriskoviak, head coach for the University of Utah basketball team, thank you so much for being part of Three Questions. You bet, Bob. Good to be with you. You're coming off of a 23-12 and 12 season and the first appearance in the NIT Finals in 44 years. You've been to the tournament since then, but uh, into the finals in 44 years. And uh, over the last seven years, this has been a huge turnaround of a program. Your first year, 6-25. and 25. Now yeah. you're at 25-12. and 12. What would you say is the key to that big turnaround in the program? Wow, it's really hard to identify one thing I, you know one of the, the sayings that we have in our program is just to keep chopping wood and uh, I was asked when I was first hired you know you, the people are looking for the uh, the barometer as to what's going to make it successful and uh, you know you just we had a lot to do a lot of work to do that first year I never had more fun in my life coaching a six win team uh, some great guys we got it signed a lot of guys late that particular year, but they also didn't have a lot of stars behind their name, uh, and they were really driven and hardworking kids. And then, you know, our recruiting I think picked up a little bit. You, great recruits, you know, when you can get a Delon Wright and a Jakob Pertle and a Kyle Kuzma, they make you a lot better coach. And at the end of the day, it, re it really is the lifeblood of the program. I think is in the recruiting. That first year, you had eight players leave the program after you came, and that must have been terribly frustrating for you. Uh, what I wonder is, number one, how did you manage that frustration? And number two, how did you keep from losing hope and the administration losing hope, and more importantly, the fans losing hope in University of Utah basketball? Well, it was interesting. Um, you know, when we, when we signed all those young men, late in the process, we sat down with each and every one of them and let them know that we're not signing a four-year scholarship. Uh, we have a, sign a second signing period in April, and we ended up taking a lot of those kids in May. So they obviously didn't have many options, or they would have signed. Uh, and a lot of those individuals, we said, come to Utah, we're going to coach the heck out of you, you're going to be a part of a great conference and a great institution, but there's no guarantee when this is said and done that we're going to have this relationship, uh, you know, continue. And, uh, and so we had the blessing of the administration, all those kids, their families, everybody was on the same page. I think it was a shock to the community because when the season ended and we talked to those individuals, it was time for them to move on. They weren't Pac-12 players, a lot of them. Uh, and I know all of them. We, we maintain great relationships with all of them. They've all landed on their feet. We stay in touch. Uh, it's disheartening to lose those guys, but we kind of needed to step it up in our recruiting efforts, and that's where we've gone. How much mentoring do you do? One-on-one -on -one wow. mentoring with these players do you actually do? Yeah, I'm getting goosebumps when you ask that question. You know, I think that's probably uh, mentoring comes in a lot of different ways. Uh, behind the scenes in the office. Some kids maybe need a father figure. Uh, some kids come from a perfectly normal background, you know, the two-parent background and, you know, more of a coach. Um, but I, I love that part of it. And that's what's so cool about college basketball is, is these kids are still looking oftentimes for that mentor or a difference maker in their life. And so if that can be on the basketball court, if it can be helping them get through some tough times, uh, whatever the case might be, those relationships are probably the most important thing. And that's the huge difference. People ask me all the time the difference between NBA and college and do you want to go back. And NBA people have already had those mentors and difference makers to help them get to that elite level. In college, uh, some of those relationships and, and just knowing, I've heard from guys and you know, when somebody sends you an email or calls you and reminds you of that, mm -hmm. uh, it's really, it's really priceless. Mm -hmm. You have a reputation of being very strict in the way you play basketball and, and the way you want the team to play basketball. Tell me, if you will, what is the relationship between discipline and success at the college level? Mm -hmm. Good question. I've heard about you in these questions. <laughs> um, well, we, we have non-negotiables in our program, and, and we make those very clear with, uh, with our kids as we're recruiting them. You know, it's a little bit of a high standard. I, I love uh, coaching at Utah. I went to the Jazz game the other night. I mean, people understand the game. This is not one of those uh, states that, you know, basketball just kind of slips through the cracks. And I think 
Uh, there's been a lot of great coaches that have come before me at Utah. Uh, Coach Sloan, the Jazz, you know, and to me, uh, you want to be a team that nobody outworks you. And coaching effort is really hard, you know. So I think my job, our staff's job, is to is to help guys get through some barriers, make sure they can do a little bit more uh, than they're giving us. And to me, basketball is one of the ultimate sports, team sports, in terms of connectedness. Mm -hmm. uh, very, it's very rare if you look at baseball, football, you have one job. You run out there and you're on offense or you're on defense. You're at the plate or you're in the field. Mm -hmm. uh, the game of basketball, as, as you know and the viewers know, is constantly changing. So the ability, I think, to be a two-way player and be able to kind of flip the switch and get on to the next play, um, knowing those five guys are all you know defensive scheme and offensive set whatever it is you're trying to do to me it's really a, a cohesive deal and if if you have a weak weakness in that chain we always talk about you know you're only as strong as the weakest link so some of that discipline i think comes from the importance in trying to help our players understand that uh, you know they owe it to their teammates they owe it you know it's more than themselves so um, I think that's where a lot of the discipline comes is trying to trying to play the game the right way and and we certainly strive to do that. Uh, I don't think you'll find many people who won't say that discipline is a very important part of any game that you play in any athletic endeavor. But under the Coach K system, what does discipline look like specifically? Um, you know, that first year, Bob, we had a heck of a time getting guys to places on time. Mm -hmm. uh, I can remember we were playing our first Pac-12 game, which I was pretty excited about. We made it through the preseason. Uh, we get to the Pac-12 game. We had one player late for the bus leaving Salt Lake, and one player was late to our team meeting once we got to Colorado, and another player was late for the bus to shoot around. And we got our tails whipped uh, in Colorado. And I've never been more incensed in my life in the locker room after that game. I probably kept the players in there for over an hour. Wow. And we weren't talking about basketball. We were talking about doing things the right way. And I can remember specifically telling our team, this might be one of those rare years where I've just got to teach a lot of guys how to tell time. But until we can figure out how to tell time, it's really hard to move on to pick and roll coverage and trying to figure out how to score. So uh, I think it changes, you know, you, and that's what's great about college sports. We've got a different team next year coming in than we'll have this year. So there's different things that they have to be taught. Uh, I like where we're starting with all these guys, really solid cores and culture and background, but culture's a big part of it. And uh, that's a non-negotiable, you know? And so if you get a, a coach, or a, I'm sorry, a player-driven team, maybe the year we went to the Sweet 16, a lot of those players had heard my speeches and they understood discipline. Mm -hmm. And we were able to talk a heck of a lot more about how we were gonna to try to beat Duke to get to the Elite Eight. And that discipline is different than some of the basic discipline. So uh, it, it depends on the given year. Recruiting is so important in college basketball. What is it that you look for in a recruit that will fit into your system? Yeah, well, first off, you know. They uh, have to be able to tell time, right? They have to be able to tell time, and it's amazing what some <laughs> kids still, what they don't know. But, um, you know, obvi the first thing is sp we're pretty specific now. When we first got here, we needed a little bit of everything. We needed two guys at every position, yeah. right? So uh, it was a little vague. Now you, you have guys graduating, two bigs, uh, Justin Bibbins and Gabe, and you've got, you know, hey, we need a point guard. We need a two, two guard. We need a small forward. Um, and then, you know, over time, it's no different than your job. You learn things. Uh, and, and probably more than anything, I've learned to uh, trust my own intuition. Mm -hmm. When you have a little voice in your head talking to you about, and you look back on maybe how it didn't work out with a certain kid here, and you saw those signs early, mm -hmm. but you didn't listen to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then maybe the flip side of that, a kid like Brandon Taylor, that um, I tried to talk myself out of, you know dozens of times and his number kept popping up on my desk or I kept thinking about what an amazing person he was. Uh, one of the few kids that actually cried uh, with me when he committed to our school and then he turns yeah. around and is the Pac-12 Scholar Athlete of the Year and all these you know and you look back and so when you have those experiences uh, sometimes you just go with your gut but I, I go into a gym 
oftentimes, and I'll watch how they come into the gym. I'll watch who they come in with. I'll watch how they get ready for a, a game what the interaction is with the student section after the game. That was one thing about Brandon Taylor. He was like the Pied Piper of that high school, mm -hmm. and he drew kids to him when the game was over. So obviously you've got the skill part of it, the basketball side of it, but a lot of times it needs to be taken a close look at behind the scenes, talking to school counselors and different people, and it's a little bit more than just putting the ball in the basket. How has basketball changed your life? Oh, my. Uh... Well, um, I was actually talking to one of our recruits about it um, in depth, and I, I don't know where I'd be without it. I mean, it was my, uh, it was my outlet as a, a young kid, and I was very fortunate to be uh, in a neighborhood with some older kids that were jocks and loved to play basketball. and. Um, it was an escape for me. How uh, so? Uh, you know, things weren't super easy at home. I lost my mom when I was young, when I was eight. Mm -hmm. she, she passed away uh, from Hodgkins. Uh, uh, and, you know, father um, came from Poland. Uh, you know, uh, didn't exactly, it wasn't the best. At, you know, it was difficult for him to raise a kid. My older brother, nine years older, was gone. He was off to college, and so it was me and my father. And um, I just always found a sanctuary on the court. Um, you know, I'd, I'd go out to the courts when I was a little kid, and I'd wait at the same playground and hope that my own age kids would show up, age before cell phones. Mm -hmm. You know, and then I would just hope and pray that the older kids would come and that there would be an odd number, so maybe I would get to play. Um, but I can just... I Were can, you tall back then? Yeah, I was always taller. I, I've seen some, you know, second, third grade class photos where you're the, the goon in the back that everybody thinks has probably <laughs> been held back three years. Um, so, yeah, I was, you know, physically I was always, always really skinny, though. Um, but to me it's just been, it's been a godsend. I mean, I've coached, I've traveled all over the world. It hit me the other day when we were going to the airport and I was with my daughters, 10-year-old daughters, and uh, I'd lost my driver's license, so I had to have my passport. And oh, she no. started she started looking through my passport while we were checking in out there at Delta. And, she, you know, she started reading all the countries. And I just remember that kind of resonating with me, like, man, this sport of basketball has been great to me. I was thinking back on, you know, China and France and all mm -hmm. these places. and. Uh, it's just completely changed my life. I don't know where I'd be without it, obviously. You spent 10 years in the NBA, a lot of it with the Bucks, but you were mm -hmm. here for a year with yeah. the Jazz, and so you kind of know that system. Yeah. Now where you're sitting at the University of Utah as the head basketball coach, which would you say is more satisfying, that dream come true of going to the NBA and playing mm. at that level or coaching these young men at the University of Utah? Which is more satisfying? No, it's a great question. I don't know if it's a matter of satisfaction, um, but it's a matter, I know for me personally, as a player, I feel like I maximized all of my ability and you know, the dream of getting to the NBA was a very special thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also felt a little bit of a sense of not having a lot of control. And I think a lot of that stemmed from my injuries. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, once I had a, a pretty significant in, in knee injury and then I had a hard time staying healthy. And so as much as I wanted to enjoy that opportunity to be in the NBA, it was a bit of a grind. About the halfway point on was, you know, that's why I was able to play for the Jazz for a year. But they didn't want to, well, actually, they did offer me a, a long-term deal. That's one of my big regrets is oh. to not have hit it. But I had an agent that was telling me, no, we can get more. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I could have been here for four years. Um, but I played here a year, Chicago a year, Orlando a year, uh, and so those, you know, part of that was my health. As far as a coach goes, I feel like, you know, I'm in so much more control. And I do feel like if in the overall scheme of things, I think God put me here uh, with the purpose of being a coach. And you mentioned mentor earlier and doing this more so than he did as a player. And, and uh, this, is, this is so enjoyable. It's cool to be able to be a part of a team. That's the great thing about the, the players, if you ask them what they miss most, 
it's the camaraderie, it's the teamwork, it's the adrenaline, all of that coming together for the jump ball. And now, man, when that was over as a player, but now I get to take part in it as a coach. So it's really a blessing to be able to do that. What would you say is the sweetest moment you have had associated with basketball? Mmm. Oh, that's a good one. Uh, one of my highlights was winning a gold medal um, for the U.S. Actually, to take it a step back prior to that, uh, I went to the sports festival when I was 18 with 48 other guys from the United States. Mm -hmm. um, Where was that? That was in uh, Colorado Springs. Okay. And I was part of the West team. And we knew going in that they were going to select three players from each team, three from the West, North, South, and, and East. And you were going to get a chance to represent the country. So it was, it was kind of odd. But the first thing they had us do was get measured for all the USA gear. Mm -hmm. And I can remember being in that room. And you talk about you know a kid that's just dreaming about the opportunity to wear a United States Jersey and uh, so when when I got that phone call about a month after that event that was one of those moments where I just you know it's to the moon yeah. like you get to go do this <laughs> uh, and then the practice with some great players uh, once again you know goosebumps, you got goosebumps. Um, <laughs> I'm looking at him. Wow. Uh, and then we beat the Soviet Union in the gold medal game Arvidas Sabonis was was the big guy on their oh, team wow. and and we beat them we were playing in Mallorca Spain uh, and, you know, hearing the national anthem, uh, standing there with your teammates was one of those big highlights. Wow. Um, one of the others undoubtedly was making the Sweet 16 with the Utes. That was really cool. Um, beating Georgetown and getting an opportunity to do that. And you get a little taste of that, man. And it's, you know, the Duke game was one of those examples where it's the perfect uh, statement comes into play that, you, you, you know, you feel so close to something yet so far away. Mm -hmm. uh, and we played Duke as well as anybody did that year. You know, if you look at their six games to the national championship, so you wonder maybe if the bracket would have been a little different or, mm. or DeLon doesn't get in foul trouble, but yeah. you get a taste of what, that was a highlight. That was a highlight. What would you say is the state of college basketball right now? Mm. There, there have been some scandals. <laughs> yeah, you think? <laughs> uh, well, it's, I don't think any of us are real proud um, of it, you know, and um, I think things have gotten a little out of, out of whack the longer time has gone on with all these rules and, you know, obviously there's an awful lot of money involved in every capacity uh, and when money gets involved, um, you know, things tend to head over the line a little bit and um, so it's been rough and uh, disheartening, I think, is a good word for us, you know, and the whole season's gone by and not much been mentioned. And so when you're trying to stay within the lines, you, you know that you, the human nature of it is if, sure. if you're trying to do the right thing and maybe other people aren't, you'd like to see them get put in a timeout, you know? <laughs> yeah, in the penalty <laughs> box or something. Instead of having to play them, yeah. you know? So yeah. uh, I think all that's going to come about. Um, but it gets back, I had a, a, a great booster come in and he actually coached me up. Um, you know, gave me some some tips, and I think the key is is you don't you don't make yourself a victim, you know. And I got I was a little whiny when it was all happening, and we don't cheat, and you try to put yourself above it. Yeah. And his lesson to me, which which really took hold, was whatever you're doing, there's going to be immoral people that cross the line and do things. And if you want to spend your time thinking about, you know, what they're doing. Obviously, you're taking a lot of the energy away from the job that you have. And right. so I, you got to steer away from it and get focused back on what we're doing at Utah and, and the kids that we have in the program and trying to do things the right way. And, and you hope that at some point, um, you know, they are going to get put in that penalty box. Yeah. There is a debate going on right now in this country. Uh, should college athletes be paid? I don't think so. Uh, personally, I don't think so. Why not? Well, I think they are being paid. I, I think when you when you take out all the taxes and the net effect, I can remember my dream was getting a Division One scholarship and not have I couldn't have gone to college mm. without it. I, you know, and uh, 
the percentages of players that are professional from college is minuscule, one, two percent. Mm -hmm. So the the masses, and I, I get the argument, well, the NCAA is making all this money, you should give it back. I, I'm not going to buy into that. You know, I think when you when you do the math on a on a the travel, the food, the tuition, everything, you're getting up to three, four hundred thousand dollars before tax, after you know the after tax of what it would cost somebody. And uh, I, it was a time of my life. College sports were now. I like the stipend idea. You know, the cost of living that we were giving our guys, maybe four or five thousand a year to help them with some bills. Yeah, Th those rules have loosened, and I agree with that. But I just don't know where it ends. And you've got three hundred and seventy some Division One programs. They can't all afford within their budgets to pay players. So it gets a little complicated. I'm more of a purist than old school, and let's draw the line between what becomes a professional and I'm all for if a player comes out of high school and wants to go to the end let's let them go and I hope they abolish the the one and done mm -hmm. uh, I think that's been bad for every party involved I think it's bad for the kids that are involved with it because they don't learn what college is like right and I think it's bad for the sport I, I don't think it's helped the NBA you know we were a one-year farm system basically for them and I think they could use a longer period of time so ready, hopefully yeah. they can abolish that. I think we're right on the on the cusp of that hap happening. You've got Kyle Kuzma, Jakob Pertl, Andre Miller, Michael Doliak, Andrew Bogut, Delon Wright, all in the NBA the, who came through the Ute program. Yeah, awesome. How important is it for Ute players to make it to the NBA? How important is that for the overall program? Well, it's it's super important because it's part of uh, you, you want to have that in on you know on the resume. Yeah. As a, everybody wants to play. You know, we'll we could ask uh, 15 guys on our team next year what their goal is, and it's to play in the NBA. And I'm not here to tell them they can't. The the one thing we do promise our guys when they come to school here is they're going to get their degree, and they're going to reach their potential. And the numbers are slim. To reach that NBA but quite honestly so much more important in the deal it's not about us Utah it's it's being able to see Delon and Jakob and Kyle now knowing that they reached their potential mm -hmm. and the pinnacle of the whole thing to me that's to know where those three came from mm -hmm. and I can remember being at lunch in Vienna Austria with Jakob and asking him what his goal was and he said NBA and I just remember thinking man Good luck with that, you know. Yeah. And Delon is the same way, and Kuz is the same way. Right, yeah. But you do whatever you can to, you push them every day. You chop wood. You get a little bit better. You don't talk a lot about it, because mm -hmm. if you're talking a lot about it, it probably means you're not doing not what doing you, it. you're yeah. not doing it. Yeah. Uh, and all the experiences I've had, the guys that are there are the guys that are doing it. And that's one thing all three of those guys got the, their work ethic. Um, but you know, we had all three of them come back for the football game and got introduced. And to me, that's uh, that was pretty special, you know, when, when you know you had a little part in it. Obviously, the fans can watch those guys now, Toronto's success in the playoffs and Kuzma's success. So um, it, makes it, it makes it pretty darn special. Mm. Let's talk about BYU for just a moment. Uh, we're, it's been a while since that dust-up, and, uh, and you had that cooling-off period. Now you're back playing the, the Cougars again. Did that cooling off period actually help the relationship between the two schools? Oh, I don't think so. I, I you know, to be frank, I don't think it was long enough. Um, you know, and the powers that be got us reacquainted a little earlier than I would have liked to have. But, you know, who am I to say? Um, You're just the head coach. That's all. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it was a big deal. Obviously, yeah. it was a big deal, and um, uh, I wouldn't have done it. I, you know, looking back on it, I wouldn't change anything. The only, the only regret I have is um, I, I absolutely love who I worked for, Dr. Hill, mm -hmm. and I think it was hard on him yeah. uh, because I think he, he, you know, compromised and um, you know thought he didn't have any control and how dare you? And I was so fortunate to have somebody that I had a great working relationship and he believed in what I was saying. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I know that that was hard on him. That's the one thing I'd like to take back. But um, it wasn't long enough, and you know we're back at it now. So I'm going to try to focus on the things I can control once again. 
in rivalry games, the, the intensity, especially leading up to it, is so strong. Mm. There's so much drama. There's so much distraction. And then there are the risks involved. Because if BYU isn't ranked and you guys lose to them, that hurts your chances to get into the NCAA tournament down the road. If you beat them, it doesn't mean anything mm. because they aren't ranked. Why even play BYU? Well, that's kind of was what, what I was thinking. <laughs> you know, again, it's not my idea. Uh, and it, you know, I love, I do love the rivalry games, and I don't think BYU is a, is ever going to be a bad loss. You know, I think their program is certainly stable and solid enough to where if you lose uh, a game to BYU, it's not going to be something that the committee's sitting there and saying. Oh. Boy, they, they, you know, they really that's, not a, bad, yeah, that's yeah. not a bad loss. People yeah. that understand basketball know that they're, you know, a great program. The one element that comes into play is when you're playing a lot of in-state schools, you know, uh, by the rule of the law, you have that much less flexibility to go and enhance your schedule in other ways. Scheduling beyond, besides recruiting is probably the hardest part of it. So if you're playing two or three in-state schools each time, that means you can't go get a piece of the ACC or right. the Big Ten or anything right. like that with dates and conflicts because it's, you know, a, about a third, a quarter of the preseason schedule. So it's complicated, and I understand everybody's perspective and what they want to do, but um, no, I, that, that one I don't think, the BYU I don't think is going to be a problem. Dr. Chris Hill, the athletic director at University of Utah, is retiring after 31 years. What does that mean to your program? Mm, well, uh, you know, there's a little bit of an unknown with who the with who the next guy's coming in. I think so many things are in place, though. You know, it, there's going to be a lot of people that want the job. Uh, as we know, there's a great internal candidate in Kyle Brennan that I think could do a wonderful job. Um, but there's not going to be a lack of of uh, resumes that come floating in. Um, great league, great environment, great tradition, all those things. So, you know, uh, you know, I think for the most part, the budget's in place. Um, a lot of things are in place here, and there's a little bit of an unknown. I do know if it's Kyle, um, it's going to be far less of a transition because we've I've worked with Kyle for seven years, and I have the utmost respect for him. And I think um, there's a big positive in, in handing the keys over to somebody that gets the lay of the land. It's always dicey. It's hard to get involved with job searches and, you know, a vote of confidence. But I think it's pretty obvious that Kyle would make a great candidate. You played for a year for the Utah Jazz when you were in the NBA. You know the inside of the organization. How would you assess how they're doing at this point in the season? Oh, my. I mean, it's, it's been a, an unbelievable year for them. And, uh, we, we were fortunate to have a lot of the jazz players and staff in our facility this summer as they did their remodel uh, and, and did renovations on their facility. So we crossed paths. We were lifting weights and doing a lot of things with the guys. I think it's really a bonus to have a pro team in your town. You know, it, it's uh, obviously it's, it, it's part of how great basketball is. But for our recruits to be a lot of times we can bring recruits in maybe this time of year. Yeah. Uh, and see a jazz game and have that interaction. I know the guy behind us, Justin Bibbins and Donovan Mitchell, mm -hmm. uh, have become really close. And Donovan was at a bunch of our games. There's nothing like seeing a guy, you know, coming. NBA schedule's not easy. Yeah. And, and I called, uh, you know, I called the, the jazz, Dennis Lindsay, after a couple of things that I'd heard happened at our games and said, you got yourself a special one there. Mm -hmm. He not only is sitting courtside, but he's going up and, and helping ki disadvantage kids and some things, you know, uh, my wife was talking to him, hey, could you come in this sick child and different things, so, uh, and then on the court, I mean, <laughs> my, I, I, oh my. I, I wasn't expecting it, yeah. I, I, you know, Quinn's done an unbelievable job, Dennis, to get the, the right pieces, yeah. I think it's a perfect example of, you don't need a lot of star power, you need some guy, those guys pass the ball, they defend, you know, all those little things. And I was at the game the other night, uh, game four yeah. Yeah, against Oklahoma City, and I've never heard, uh, whether it be a concert or a sporting event, it louder than it was at the end of the third quarter 
uh, with about a minute to go in that third quarter. It was deafening. The players couldn't hear if there was a whistle or not during the live action. Wow. And you could see them looking at the referees trying to figure out, was that a foul? You know, <laughs> it was it was pretty cool. So uh, it's fun to be in the city, you know, soaking it up, and uh, everybody gets an extension on their basketball, and hopefully we can keep it rolling. Do you think the Jazz are going to go all the way this year? Is this a year for a, an NBA championship for the Jazz? Well, I, I know I, if you're a betting man, you'd say no, um, you know, from a rational doing the numbers on it, which, you know, it's all about data and numbers right now. Um, but I do know this, you, you know, if we beat Oklahoma City, Houston's not exactly exactly a fine, finely tuned machine right now. They've had some chinks in their armor a little bit going down the stretch. So you get by that one, you know, and then all of a sudden you're in the final four. Uh, weirder things have happened, but I, I've always been of the. It's always about it's about this game five coming up tonight. Yeah, you know, so you can't get ahead of yourself. But uh, I I wouldn't bet against them, but I wouldn't be going and plopping money down on them. You know, to answer your question, but they've got a lot of the pieces I think to make to, to make a strong push. Well, Coach Larry Kriskoviak, head coach of the University of Utah men's basketball team, thank you so much for being part of Three Questions. Yeah, it was fun, Bob. Thank you. You're back.